Okay, folks. Now, I know some of you came specifically for the festival, so this is just frosting on the cake. You get to be here for Bible study. Should be coming anyhow. Now, let me make two or three announcements before we start. Announcement number one, right at the top of your review sheet, no class, October 12. No class, October 12. Put that on your refrigerator door. No class, October 12. Stay home and be nice to your husband. I mean, that's what we're talking. That's what we're talking about today. <laughs> I am going to do a thing I haven't done for a long time. I'm going to take all of my children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren to Branson, Missouri. That's what I'm going to, I told him, we'll either leave there loving each other or we'll go home saying, that was not a good idea. Because <laughs> they're scattered. They don't get to see each other very often. I get to see them. But we're going to do this and I have to have an extra day to get rested. <laughs> To drive. 24. And one on the way. We're, no. <laughs> Take you as a babysitter. <laughs> All right. That's number one. No class. October 12th taking the day off. The renovation project. Now, we had a good time in here on Sunday, and I told you very candidly what it was all about. We've got to raise some money. We've got to raise $250,000. And so, I want to make you known, and some of you had questions. I don't have all the answers because I don't know all the questions. We have received the revised plan back from the architect and the construction person. And we do still plan to be on schedule to be finished and occupy the space in February of 2022. Now we're trying to get all the money in and collected by November 16. We'll keep that in mind. And I'll be reminding you of it every time we meet. Glad to see the carpenters back. Yeah. And he's out of his Roman soldier outfit. Good to see you, Jim and Joyce. Glad you're here. Come in, folks. Now, for those of you that haven't been attending Bible study, we're in 1 Peter. If, you'd like, if you have your Bible and would like to turn there, and we're at that very sensitive section where he's talking about personal relationships. He talked about personal relationships to the government first, interestingly enough, how that we ought to obey the law because government is ordained by God. And government by God must be respected by believers in Jesus Christ. And we agreed that there were times when you simply could not abide by the law that had been passed by the government. For instance, if the Supreme Court of the United States passes a law saying that abortion is legal and can be done anywhere at any time in any trimester of the person's life, I'm not going, and you cannot preach against it, you cannot preach against it, I am not going to obey that law. I'm going to preach. 
Uh, I may not look as good behind bars as I do, but I'm going to, I am opposed to abortion, period. No questions asked. That doesn't mean everybody has to be, doesn't mean everybody is, that's obvious. But I am, and I'm a preacher of the gospel, and that's what I'm going to do. Now that's what I mean when I say you don't have to obey all the laws. For instance, when the Sanhedrin told Simon Peter, you stop preaching about Jesus. He said, I can't do that. You decide. I can't do that. Do I listen to God or do I listen to man? I just can't. They put him in prison and they were going to kill him as a result because they had martyred James and now they were going to martyr Simon Peter. So relationship to government. And then we get into those more sensitive relationships that are interpersonal relationships. And he talks about the wife in relationship to her husband. Now that's where we started last time and we're going to pick up today. It is a very sensitive subject in the United States of America. Very sensitive. All you have to do is say the word submission and somebody's hackles go up. And I just remember in the husband and wife relationship, it is mutual submission to each other. Just remember in the husband and wife relationship, it is not my rights that matters, it is my love that matters. And love is never, love is never mean and unkind. And I know you don't have to tell me I've repented more times than you can possibly imagine. You just sometimes lose your temper. You're up to here and above. And I understand that. You don't have to explain that to me. But that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right. We are to love one another. How is a husband to love his wife? Paul tells us in Ephesians. He says, as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? He loved the church enough he died for it. If your husband is willing to die for you, I can tell you, you're not going to have much trouble with submission if your husband is willing to die for you. Now, submission does not mean to become a doormat. It does not mean to be a lap dog. It does not mean any of that. It means my best terminology. It is volunteer selflessness. Selflessness. Volunteer selflessness. Now, I can only tell you what the scripture says. This is not my idea. This is what the scripture says. Wives, three things about submission. One, it is an obligation. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husband. Respect may be a good word, but it, the word submission is there. You can't get rid of it. It's an obligation. Secondly, remember that Peter is talking in terms of an unsaved husband when he's talking here. That's why he spends more time talking about the wife than he does the husband is because she's going to have the most difficult time handling it. An unsaved husband, a saved wife, and he's talking to her. So it is an opportunity, an opportunity to display Christ. I've said to wives, I don't know how many times across the years, you're not going to nag him into the kingdom of God. It's not going to happen. You're not going to preach him into the kingdom of God. I'll tell you the best way you can help get him in the kingdom of God. Live like Jesus before him. Live like Jesus before your husband. That will be the best way in the world to get him into the kingdom of God. Be on display. In fact, that is the best defense we have for Christianity is how we live. It's not what we say, and we have to say, because we're 
were commissioned to witness and to go into all of the world. That's not what I'm talking about. But we have to live out a life that says, I have been in contact with Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of my life, and to the best of my ability, I'm trying to follow in his steps and to live like he lives. As a result, we must understand and come to grips with the fact that here is an opportunity for the unsaved wife. Now, the same thing could be true, but he happens to be talking to the wife. It could be said to the husband as well. If the wife is an unbeliever and the husband is a believer, the husband has the same responsibility of living out the life of Christ in front of his wife. He has that responsibility. But you know what I've discovered across the years? Very few men raised to the spiritual level of their wife. I, don't, don't ask me why. I'm just telling you, you can say amen. My observation is, my observation is, very few men rise above the spiritual condition of their wife and her walk. Now, I am a product, and you know I would be more biased because I am a product of someone who married when she was saved already married an unsaved man. I'm a product of someone's Christian life and experience. So I would naturally feel probably stronger about this than some other folks do. Nancy set before me what a Christian ought to look like before we were ever married. That makes a difference. That makes a difference. I, I don't know that I've told you and I don't know that you need to know, but I'm going to tell you. I broke an engagement with my high school sweetheart to marry Nancy. Someone asked me, well, why would you do that? That was complicated because my brother had married my high school sweetheart's sister. <laughs> that complicated it even further. But I tell you, when somebody said, why would you do that? There was something about her conduct, Nancy's conduct, that had such an appeal to my lost life. Now, I'm not saying that because she's dead and gone. I'd say it if she was still sitting at this table. It's true. It's true. And I remember when I went back to preach my first revival after God had called me to preach, after she had led me to Christ and God called me to preach, went back to Lover's Leap Baptist Church. Why are you laughing? That's a town where I grew up. No, I, Lover's Leap was a suburb of Anstead, was where I grew up. Now that's, that's, where, that's where the Indians, you remember? She was from one tribe, he was from another tribe. Their dad wouldn't let them have anything to do with each other, they did anyhow. They got into trouble, they came and they ran and they saw and they jumped off. The Lover's Leap. And they have that rock there. That, of course, there's seven of them in West Virginia. But they, <laughs> they have that rock there where they jumped, where they jumped. And I, I thought to myself, I ain't going to jump off no cliff. <laughs> All right. So the wife, let me get back on track the wife and the responsibility of the unsaved husband or the husband and the responsibility of the unsaved wife. You live the life before them and that's what matters most. Now, here's a statement I want you to write down either in your mind or on paper. Paper's cheaper than brain so you ought to write it on paper. Most of life's learning comes from watching an example 
of someone else. Most of life's learning comes from watching an example of someone else and seek to imitate what they see. Seek to imitate what they see. Now, that means be careful of your example. Be careful who you watch. And I mentioned to you last time, Hollywood does not have the answer to marriage. Don't get caught up in watching someone just because they're in a high place. Now, let me just finish up, summing up about the wife. Three things. Submissiveness. Oh, I'm going to get back to that. Thank you. Submissiveness, purity, and reverence toward God. Three things. All right. What's it? Yes, I'm getting ready to go back to it right now. That was just the warm up. <laughs> that was just bringing these folks that do not come up to date on where we are. All right, now, review sheet number 12. Review sheet number 12. The matching. Beseech. F. Beg. Plead. Beseech. F. Number two. Peculiar. I. Unique. Unique means one of a kind. So when you say unique, you do not need to say unique, one of a kind. That's what unique means, one of a kind. One of a kind. That is I. Number three, bishop, A, guardian, guardian. Sheep, J, we are sheep of his pasture. He is the shepherd of our life. And the shepherd is absolutely essential to the care of the sheep. Rod 5B, protection, protection. Staff, change that word, that should be correction, H. Correction, the rod is for protection, I'm sorry, the, the rod is, I flip those around, the rod is for correction, and the staff is for protection. I know that's what I said, one of them changed one of them. All right, you got that? Okay, here we go. Husband and wife. Number seven, husband and wife. D, the most personal, intimate relationship in human experience is husband and wife. It is the D, most personal relationship. More personal than mother and father and child is the husband and the wife relationship. Number eight, C. Now, these are Simon's words, not mine. He calls the woman the weaker vessel. The weaker vessel. I don't know what he was thinking. <laughs> but that's what the scripture says. And so I'm just telling you what the scripture says. I think, I'm, I think he means physically. The husband should be the stronger vessel physically because a husband does have a responsibility of taking care and protecting his wife and family. Now, I know you can give me examples where that's not true and you can give me examples where the husband is gone and the wife has to assume that responsibility. I understand that, but normally, 
normally. It is the husband who is seen as the protector of the family. That's why when wartime comes, so many years, I know in World War II we had the waves and the wax. I understand that. Women in the military. I understand that. But basically, the army was made up of men when they went to battle. It was the men who went to battle to protect their families. All right. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Number nine, rights, E, versus grace. Versus grace. And number 10, authority, G. Authority is necessary for conduct. You have to have laws to live by. You have to have laws to live by. So it's necessary for conduct. Okay, number two, use at least three, use, list at least three uses of episkopos in the New Testament. Now that sounds like Episcopalian. Here they are. A guide, a guide. Now separate those two in your mind. He's not talking about the Episcopal church. He's talking about a word in Greek, episkopa, a guide. Number two, a protector, a protector, especially of theology, especially of theology. Number three, an overseer, an overseer of public morals or public morality. And number four, an administrator of law and order. All of those are uses of the word episkopa in the Greek New Testament. Say four again, please. Four again, please. Administrator of law and order. An administrator of law and order. Number three, Jesus is our great example for suffering. Because his life is our example. If he suffered, we're going to suffer. And sometimes we will suffer physically. Other times we will suffer mentally. Other times we will suffer spiritually. All of those things come into play. And this is, this is one reason why when you come to talk about the end of time, when you come to talk about the, the great tribulation that's going to come, pastors into this on Sunday night, where hailstones, a thousand pound hailstone fall out of the sky. We need to understand, suffering comes to the people of God. Now, I believe in the rapture of the church. I don't believe her, I don't believe one's going to fall on me. I believe in the rapture of the church. But leading up to the rapture of the church, please understand there's going to be tribulation on the church. There's going to be a time of great tribulation on the church. That may not be that great tribulation of seven years we talk about between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. May not be that seven years of awful, awful tribulation that we read about in the book of Revelation. But I'm telling you, folks, I'm telling you, if you haven't seen it coming, it's coming. It's coming. There is already in the world today a tremendous dislike, if not hatred, for Christianity. There's already, it's already here. It's already here. If you don't think it's true, watch what happens in Washington, D.C. It is unconscionable, some of the things they're saying, some of the things they, that are simply anti-Christian. Anti-Christian. And they just don't like us. And you know why they don't like us? Because of the way we live. Because we don't agree with them. Listen. 
You don't have to agree with me, but you do have to love me. I don't have to agree with them, but I do have to love them. And that is a tough assignment. A tough assignment. But the office of the presidency of the United States of America deserves our respect regardless of who's in the chair. In my opinion, my very humble but quite accurate opinion. <laughs> so, okay. Number two, his life is a substitute for my life. I give it up, he takes it. He comes into my life. He lives in me. And we can talk about God living in us, Jesus living in us, the Holy Spirit living in us, and we've said the same thing three times. All of the Trinity of God has come to live in us. That gives us a, that's why it's called born again. A new life. I'm born again. Nicodemus couldn't understand it. Lord, I don't understand this born again. Can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? He said, Nicodemus, you're a ruler of the Jews and you don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I'm going to give my life for your life. You're going to be born again. I'm going to come to live in you. And to get Nicodemus on the same page, you remember he backs up and says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He did not come to condemn the world, Jesus came to save the world because we're already condemned in our sin until Jesus becomes our substitute. So his substitution for our life, his watch over us. He is our shepherd. He is our shepherd. And this idea of shepherding, I've never owned a sheep in my life, but everybody that has ever owned sheep tells me without the shepherd, the sheep are incapable of taking care of themselves. They will walk off a cliff eating. Just walk right off the cliff eating. So he takes care of us. He takes care of us. Wives, I said this earlier, are to be submissive, pure, and reverent. Submissive, pure, and reverent. Now, let me be sure I've said all to you that I want to say about that, and I think I have the family relationship. <laughs> I read Dr. Drumwright's notes, who I took the course with, and Dr. Drumwright said, one of the, this is his quote, one of the tragic things in this day and a time is to see when women, when women are trying to become men. We don't need any more men. <laughs> this is what the script, listen, I never wanted my wife to be me. I wanted her to be my wife. And she never wanted me to be her. She didn't even teach me how to cook. That's how much she didn't want me to be her. That's how much I didn't want to be her. So all of this to say, these are relationships that are meaningful. Now, just one other thing. And God tells the man, 
Only one verse, you husbands likewise. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Live with your wives in an understanding way. I'm not going to elaborate on that. I've said enough about it. All right. Now look, chapter 3. We'll pick up a lesson today in verses 8 and 9. Finally. Now when Paul says, or Peter says, finally, he does not mean I'm about through. He means I want now to go to a different subject. I've said all on that that I need to say. Now I'm going to go to a different subject. To sum up. Now he says summing it all up. Finally. Be all of one mind. Having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Underscore that because that's an old English word that does not have the same meaning. Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, but counterwise blessing, knowing that you are there unto called, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips, they may speak without guile. guile. Let him eschew evil. There's another word we don't use much. Eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensure it. Now, Simon Peter does a thing here that I love. He gives us a list of words that describes something. Now, I want to do a little word study on these. Uh, so that we will get a better understanding of what he's asking us to do. To sum all of this up is what I want you to be. Harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted. So I'm going, there's six of them that I want you to see. Harmonious. Harmonious. Let all be harmonious. Harmony is a musical term. That's when you said Ron's going to play this stuff here in a little while. Uh, it won't always be harmonica or har harmonious, but it does mean that you live in harmony one with another. These characteristics. Together in oneness is the best definition I can find. Together in oneness. Not to be disruptive. Not to be in constant conflict. To be like-minded. Have you ever met that person who seems to be in conflict with himself or someone most of his life? He can't even get along with himself. And this is what he's talking about. Harmony needs to come to life through Jesus Christ. Harmony. A harmonious life. I have been in business meetings in Baptist church. I don't know anything about Methodist business meetings. I don't know anything about Pentecostal business meetings. I don't know about anybody's business meetings, but I know about Baptist business meetings. I have been in business meetings where there was no harmony whatsoever. Everybody was in a twit about something. I was in one meeting, four hours and 29 minutes. A business meeting, four hours and 29 minutes before we ever resolved the issue. I could have resolved it in the first five minutes because it had to do with alcoholic beverages being used by the pastor. Some said it was okay. I said, in my own, I let him talk it out because there was more to it than just that. Listen, what you're debating may not always be the major issue. 
may not always be the major issue. That underlying thing. I could have solved that one in five minutes. I would have fired him on the spot. Now, I don't know whether you're an alcoholic user or not, but let me tell you, in 65 years of preaching, I've never seen it add one positive spiritual thing to a person's life in 65 years. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to give you my don't drink sermon, but I'm just telling you, four hours and 29 minutes. I was in one business meeting in one church of which we were members. And we spent half the time about raising the price of something, $2. I, that was not the issue. That was not the real issue. That became apparent about halfway into the meeting. Now, folks, what I'm saying is there's great virtue in harmony. Great virtue in harmony. And you know when you are and you know when you're not. You know when you're singing off key. You know when you're singing off key. It becomes apparent. And you can say, oh, I'm making a joyful noise. That's true, but it's still off key. It's still off key. It's not in harmony with what everyone else is singing. The harmony. All right, second. Sympathetic. Sympathetic. It means we feel things together. Fellow feeling. Here again, I, I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not prone to use my kids as sermon illustrations because I, I have to choose which kind I want to illustrate. But my baby daughter is a friendship person. She values her friends probably as well as anyone I have ever met in my life. She loves her friends. And she's met some friends. She's, she left home in 1987 to go to the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville and has never come home. She married a young man from there. They bought land, building a, house, a whole nine yards. So one of her good friend's husband, I believe I'm correct, he's, he's younger than 50 years of age, had a stroke and died. And she was so distraught. She called me, she was so distraught about her friend. Then she called me the next day and said, Dad, do you know what I think would be good? I said, no, but you're going to tell me, aren't you? <laughs> she said, would you write Kelly a letter? Would you just write her a letter and tell her what you went through with mom's death? Would you just write her a letter? Because she has no relationship with her mother whatsoever. Her mother has not spoken to her in 10 years. Would you just write her a letter? I said, well, what about a phone call? She said, no, no. I want you to write her a letter. We don't write enough letters anymore. Write her a letter. Here's a girl I've never met. But you know what I felt as I wrote that letter? I felt the pain my daughter was going through. I felt that pain. Not just because I was talking again about Nancy's death. No, no. I was going through the same pain as my daughter. And I thought, that's what sympathy means. Fellow pain together. Sympathetic. Sympathetic. 
Indifference is a real problem with a lot of people. All right, number three, brotherly. Brotherly. I'm sure this overlaps. It adds to the dimension of the family. We have a spiritual kinship. We ought to be tender hearted, he's going to say in just a moment. Feeling for each other, being close to each other as family. I don't know how people make it in the tragic moments of life without family and friends. I I don't understand it. I don't know how they do it. We ought to care about what happens to each one of us. We ought to care about it. I'm just going to drop this in. And we certainly don't need to be un- brotherly toward each other now do you like some folks better than you do others of course you do of course you do do you know who I like in this church better than anybody else Tuesday Bible study Tuesday Bible study you know God expects you folks to come on Sunday And he really expects you to come on Wednesday night. He really expects you to come on Wednesday night. And on Sunday night, Will Rogers once said, Oklahoma builds the best roads in any state in the nation. And Baptists wear them out going to church. We just simply need to be faithful and brotherly toward each other and love each other. But you come on Tuesday. That's a step above for me. That's a step above. So you can tell your friends, do you know Dr. Sullivan loves us better than he loves you? (laughs) That won't help you, but it sure won't help me. I'm simply telling you, We love each other, brotherly love, tenderhearted, not calloused toward each other, soft, not calloused. Number uh, four, kind-hearted, kind-hearted. Kind-hearted means going a long way to show the grace of God going a long way to show the grace of God. Some people can be so unkind, but you don't need to, he's going to tell us that, you don't return return evil for evil. Kind-hearted, testifying to the grace of God, making an investment in someone's life by your kindness, Even if you have to do it at a considerable risk, you ought to take the risk. Number five, humble in spirit. King James says compassion, compassion. Compassion is being in control of yourself to the point that you are not going to let ambition rule out your compassion. Control of your life to the extent you're not going to allow your ambition to rule out your compassion. Proverbs 17, 27 said, He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a good spirit is a man of understanding. A man of understanding. Be wise, be cautious. Be compassionate. Number six, returning evil for evil, tit for tat. We do not live by the maxim, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
That's Old Testament law. That's not New Testament grace. New Testament grace is to go the second mile and the third. Ever many miles I need to go to show someone the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Do not return evil for evil. Don't give back. Give a blessing instead of being evil. Give a blessing. Just the sheer blessing of doing something or for someone else. Just the sheer blessing of doing it. You don't give a blessing hoping for someone in return, something in return. You give a blessing to bless the person. Just to bless them. A child. A pastor's wife. A friend, a neighbor. Just be a blessing to someone. Be a blessing. Well, our time is just about gone, and I'm going to stop on time because we need to get Ron Davis up here and let him entertain us some after a while. I'll go ahead and introduce... By the way, any question you have about anything I've said today that I want to answer... Oh, Proverbs 17, 27. 17, 27. Okay. All right. Ed? We ought to have a party every Tuesday. (laughs) Come to the party. (laughs) Thank you for being here, all of you. I know some of this is not your regular routine. Maybe it will help you become regular routine. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ron Davis. So when Linda and Ramona get through with their stuff, in contrary... To public opinion, I am not going to bob for an apple, <laughs> just so you'll know. We, somebody's going to, but I'm not going to bob for an apple. Now, I may hold Ed by the ankles and let him bob <laughs> for an ankle. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I can get that much water on your head, I... <laughs> okay. Ron Davis worked with me at the Baptist Building and with Lily, probably longer than did me. How many years, Ron? Almost 25. Almost 25 years. Man can do anything with his hands. He's not real smart, but he can do anything. With, he can do anything with his hands. A wonderful maintenance person. A joy to be around. Did his work without a lot of unglamorous work, without a lot of glamour, glamour expected. I came to love and appreciate him. In fact, I appreciate him so much, I sold him a used car one time <laughs> for his wife. And I gave him a good deal, and she's still driving it 23 years later. <laughs> no, she's not. <laughs> no, she's not. But Ron, we're glad to have you. We're glad to have you. Now, I think I told you this when we talked earlier. We have to have some religious music in order to qualify for a party. Okay. All right, Linda, I'm going to let you do your thing. Okay.